This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Hi, Tanya. What's shaking, bacon? You tell me. <laughs> What's crack a lacking? <laughs> I thought I'd mix it up. Yeah, you mixed it up. You threw me for a loop and you did that on purpose. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for tuning in again this week for another exciting episode of Crimes and Consequences. Before I tell the story today, I would just like to remind everyone to please hit the subscriber follow button on whatever app you're listening to. 15-year-old Mary Vincent was hitchhiking on September 29, 1978. She was standing on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley, in an area commonly known as Hitchhiker's Corner. She had originally been traveling with a friend, 26-year-old Diego Montoya, but he had been arrested the month prior for raping another 15-year-old girl in Sausalito, so Mary was on her own at this point. She was lost without Diego, and she didn't have anywhere to live or go, so she had placed a phone call to her grandfather. He lived in Los Angeles. Where are her parents? Oh, I'll tell you in a sec. He said he'd help her. She would just need to get to him, which is why on this fall day, Mary, who had no money, was waiting to hitch a ride to Los Angeles. Prior to being dropped off on the Berkeley campus by a woman who was traveling with two dogs and a man, Mary had first gotten a ride out of San Rafael by a man who dropped her off near Vallejo. Mary had come from a military family and was the middle child in a family of seven children. She left home in a hurry one day when one of her sisters told her that her father was on his way home and he had a migraine and he was very upset with Mary. I don't know what she did. But her sister told her, quote, you better run, which is what Mary did. She became a runaway, living on the streets, sleeping behind garbage cans, sometimes sleeping in cars that were unlocked, etc. And then she ran into Diego, and now we are where we are where the story began. Mary was waiting at Hitchhiker's Corner with her thumb out, wearing jeans, white tennis shoes, a light pink shirt. She had a backpack and a knit purse. Pretty soon, someone stopped, offering her a ride. He was driving a light blue Ford Econoline van. Oh, man. I know. Do not get in a van. I know. He offered to give Mary a ride if she would come up with him to his house and help him load up his van. Mary agreed and hopped into the van. While they were driving to the man's house, he introduced himself to Mary and said his name was Larry. They were driving in the North San Francisco Bay Area and soon got to Larry's house. As promised, Mary helped Larry load up some of his belongings into the van, and they were soon back on the road. And just to let you know, in case you're wondering what they were loading, it was some of his belongings because he had another house in Nevada. I know I mentioned it later, but just to make it clear here. 50-year-old Larry made conversation with Mary, saying he also had a daughter and that he was in the Merchant Marines. He talked and talked, and Mary soon fell asleep, soothed by the sound of the tires on the road. Expecting to be welcomed by the lights of the San Francisco Bay, when Mary awoke, she was shocked to see that they were heading in the wrong direction. They had passed Sacramento and were headed to Nevada. When Mary told Larry, hey, you're heading in the wrong direction, he said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm not. And he tried to make Mary believe that they were going the right way. But Mary wasn't falling for it. She yelled at him and said, Los Angeles is the opposite way of where we're going. And she was really upset. Larry apologized at this point, and he pulled the van off at the next exit into a diner that was off the highway. 
They both exited the van and went inside of the restaurant where they had a meal together. Even though he had pulled this on Mary, she decided to continue her journey with him, and they soon got back into the van. She didn't really have a lot of choices anyway. No, she didn't. They got back on the highway, headed in the correct direction this time, en route to Los Angeles. The route he took was sort of out of the way, but Mary didn't suspect anything was wrong. She just knew they were headed south. Larry had gotten a to-go cup while at the diner, and while he was driving, he grabbed a bottle of whiskey that was under a seat and filled the cup to the top, sipping his cocktail as he was driving. (laughs) Very safe. What year was this? 1978. It's the 70s. I know. No one gave a shit. When they were outside of Modesto, they found their way into Del... Puerto Canyon, where it was very, very dark and very, very quiet, except for the sound of the Sayedas. Larry pulled into the canyon and stopped the van. He told Mary he needed to take a bathroom break, and she did too, so they both got out of the van to go relieve themselves. Mary was getting ready to unbutton her jeans when Larry came up behind her and hit her in the head with a sledgehammer. Oh, man. Yeah. She, of course, was dazed. She fell back, and she tried to fight him, but Larry was too strong, much stronger than a 15-year-old girl. Larry dragged her to the van and pushed her inside. He then viciously raped her. When he was finished, he grabbed his whiskey bottle and took a swig. He passed it to her, trying to get her to calm down and stop screaming. Larry left her on the floor of the van got back in the driver's seat, started it back up, and they started driving again. I mean, that could be a severe injury. It could be. And you're not saying she's restrained. No, she's not. So I'm wondering if she's dazed. Yeah. I'm sure she has to be. I mean, a sledgehammer's no joke. No. And he's a 50-year-old man. Mary let a feeling of relief wash over her, thinking that the worst of this ordeal was over but she was very wrong. Instead of heading back onto the highway, Larry drove the van further into the canyon and parked it once again. Once parked, Larry pulled Mary out of the van onto the floor of the canyon and raped her again. He wasn't satisfied in just raping her, though. He put his hands around her throat and squeezed as hard as he could until she went unconscious. Fearing that he killed her, Larry panicked. He picked up Mary's body and put it in the van. He then started it up once again and drove even further in the canyon, looking for a place where he could hide her body. He found a drainage pipe that ran under the road they had been on and figured that was a good a place as any for stashing away his evil handiwork. However, before he took her body out of the van, Larry's mind was overthinking this whole situation. I tend to do that a lot. (laughs) I do it all the time. I overthink everything. I'm doing it right now. (laughs) He realized that if Mary's body was found relatively soon, after he pushed her into that drainage pipe, she could easily be identified through fingerprints, probably. He had to get rid of her fingerprints. Deep in the canyon, Larry was no longer on the blacktop road that wound through Del Puerto Canyon. On the dirt, Larry parked the van. He went around the back, and he opened the doors wide. He grabbed Mary's body and flung her over his shoulder, and with his free hand, he grabbed a hatchet that he kept in the van. Laying over Larry's broad shoulder, Mary regained consciousness and groaned. Larry realized at that moment that he hadn't killed Mary when he tried to strangle her. And now that she was awake, he made up his mind that he'd definitely have to kill her because she knew way too much about him and he wasn't about to go to prison for raping her. No, just go to prison for killing her. That's all, right? (laughs) Where's the logic? Well, he's not going to get caught. Of course. Because he's super smart. Super smart. Still conscious, Larry forced Mary to lie on the ground. He grabbed her right arm and held it down with one hand while the other, wielding the hatchet, came down hard on her forearm. Oh! I know, below her elbow. Oh, man. I know. Can you imagine? This poor girl is conscious while this is happening. Wow. Trying to chop off Mary's hands wasn't going to be easy, 
because he had to chop a few times at her right arm before he finally had separated it from her body. Oh, that poor baby. I know. Mary felt the intense pain shoot through her body, as well as her blood just leaving her arm. Larry then held down her left arm and did the same. (gasps) Both arms? Both arms. Oh, man, shit. I know. What? I know. I cut myself while I was cutting an onion, and it hurt so bad. I know. I know. I have one of those mandolins. Oh, I've told you that story, yes. and I oh. packed off a little chunk of my thumb, and that hurt like a son of a bitch. She, I can only imagine. She has no arms? She has no arms. God damn. I know. He did the left arm below her elbow, too, and again, like the right arm, he had to hack away several times oh. before it was finally separated. After the second arm was chopped off, Mary went into shock. Of course, and she passed out. Larry was pleased. No one would be able to identify her body now if it was found. Apparently, he doesn't know about dental records either. (laughs) Right? But okay. And he did not pull her teeth out. I'm just telling everyone now. Larry took Mary's body then and threw it off a 30-foot cliff to where the drainage pipe was. He ran down the embankment to where her body landed and stuffed her into the drainage pipe kicking and shoving her as hard as he could to get her inside until he was satisfied that she was well hidden. Not knowing whether she was alive or dead, Larry headed back to the van with Mary's hands and the hatchet in tow. Nope. No, he didn't. He took them with him. Stop. Stop it. He did. Oh my God. And he drove out of the canyon. That sick bastard. Can you fucking imagine? I just... (sighs) People are fucked. I swear to God. Anyway. I hate people. And I hate Larry. I hate Larry. He's a bastard. Minutes or hours later, I don't know because that's when Mary regained consciousness. She didn't know. Miraculously, she was still alive. She crawled to the drainage pipe opening and had almost made it out, but she just didn't have the strength to pull herself out. So there she is in this hole this tunnel with no arms trying to somehow crawl out yes in the dark and i want to tell you it was probably pitch black dark because she's in a canyon at night wow so there's no lights from like a highway or homes or anything like that she's out in the wilderness her residual limbs rested in the mud outside of the pipe and exhausted mary fell asleep. Meanwhile, Larry was on a mission to get rid of her hands. Her lower arms? Yes. He drove through the San Joaquin Valley and found himself at the Oakland Bay Bridge. He drove to the bridge's lower deck and rolled down his window. He tossed the arms out his window, one by one, into the water below. One sank to the bottom as soon as it hit the water. The other, however, was carried down the bay and would soon end up in the last place Larry would have wanted it to be. Contented that he had covered his tracks well, Larry just went home. While a lower arm is floating down the water? Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe he didn't see it. Because again, you it's pay attention to that? I would probably not throw them where I couldn't see them anymore. I don't know. I'm not Larry, though. I can't speak for him. <laughs> Nor do we want to. No. As morning came to Dal Porto Canyon, a nude Mary was awakened by the rising sun. When she opened her eyes, she was surprised to find she was still alive. She hadn't bled out because her arms had been immersed in the mud, which had sealed her injuries. Wow. Right. And I know it saved her life. Whoa. I don't know this story, so this is fascinating to me. This was a really, yeah, side note. This was a really good story. That's why I had to write it. So it coagulated the blood, right? Yes. Yes. I know. It's amazing. Summoning all of her strength, Mary pulled herself out of the drainage pipe once and for all and walked out of the canyon. As she walked on the blacktop road, she could hear cars from Interstate 5 going by and she headed toward the noise. 
there was no traffic on the road she was on. Because it's by the canyon and it's kind of like an offshoot of the highway. But she could hear it, right? Yeah, but she could hear it. But soon she did see a car coming her way. She faintly shouted, help me, help me, to the driver. But seeing the bloody, naked teenager with her arms missing was just too much of a fright for this driver to stop. He peeled away from her, leaving her alone once again. Aww. I know. This didn't deter Mary, however. She continued her walk, the unforgiving sun beating down on her. And she made sure to leave her arms in the air so the bleeding wouldn't start again. That's smart. Mm -hmm. Finally, another car approached. The driver of the car was Todd Meadows, and he had been on the road coming home from work. He often cut through the canyon as a shortcut. When he first saw Mary, he thought he was seeing things, as I can imagine. There can't possibly be a nude girl covered in blood on the road. No, that would be crazy. That would be crazy. As he got closer, he realized she was very real. He stopped his car and went up to Mary as she collapsed into his arms. It was only then Todd realized Mary had bloody, muddy, residual limbs and that her hands were missing. Mm. Todd loaded her into the backseat of his car and his first stop was at a nearby airstrip. That's where he called 911. An ambulance came and took Mary to the hospital, where she required surgery. How far of a walk was it from the canyon to get to the road, by the way? She ended up, police estimate, she ended up walking about two miles before she was finally rescued. Wow. Yeah. In the sun. Without lower arms. And without clothes. Wow. The survival instinct just kicks in and the adrenaline. Right. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Right. Has to be. Has to be. She really did have a very strong will to live. The surgeon had to amputate more of her forearm so that she could eventually be fitted with prosthetics. Police reminded the surgeon to get x-rays for them as evidence for a hopefully upcoming trial someday so that they could match maybe if her hands were ever found or what have you. But they made sure to tell the surgeon, definitely take many x-rays, make sure they're clear, all of that good stuff. Police Detective Richard Brashears from the Modesto Police Department was the first to interview Mary while she recovered in the hospital. Mary told him all she could. She told him her attacker was named Larry and he had been in the Merchant Marines. She told him everything and anything she could remember. Detective Brashears put out Larry's description on the teletype, hoping maybe he'd get stopped on a traffic violation. He also put on the teletype for officers to be on the lookout for Mary's hands. Mary had a lot of information about Larry. She really did. So it seems like it wouldn't take them that long to find him. Right. Absolutely. She was at his house. The problem is she didn't know where she was. Ah. Detective Brashears got the police sketch artist in touch with Mary, who helped him create a pretty good likeness of Larry, which was released to the media. The story went countrywide for its gruesome details, I'm imagining, and it made front page news in a lot of places. In the days after Larry's sketch made it to the newspapers, a woman named Sandra was reading the morning paper. When she opened up the paper, she saw her old neighbor, Lawrence Singleton. His face was staring right back at her. She had moved to Martinez, California, but previously had lived in San Pablo, and her next her neighbor was Larry, who was in the Merchant Marines. After she read the story in the paper, Sandra wasn't sure what to think. The sketch looked a lot like Larry, but she didn't want to jump to conclusions or accuse an innocent man. She decided not to call right away, and she slept on it. Detective Brashears was working with Mary to try and find out more information about what had happened to her. He had recently been trained in forensic hypnosis, and Mary agreed to be hypnotized. He found out many important details during their sessions, including a detailed description of Larry's home, which the sketch artist who had done the original composite sketch also drew from Mary's memory. During one of Mary's hypnosis sessions, she mentioned a distinct bridge that she and Larry traveled over on the way to his house. 
Detective Brashears and his partner, Detective Reese, then spent several days combing the neighborhoods of Vallejo, which had a bridge similar to what Mary described. However, they weren't successful in finding the house. But that didn't matter, because Sandra finally decided to call the police, call in that tip about her neighbor. Thank you, Sandra. And finally, she gave police her former address in San Pablo, and when Detective Brashear and Reese arrived and saw the neighboring home, they knew they hit pay dirt. Mary had described that there was a first aid kit in the front bay window of Larry's home, and sure enough, it was still there. Detective Brashear and Detective Reese went to the front door and knocked. No answer. They would have to wait for a search warrant to get to the next step and see if Larry Singleton was the asshole responsible for raping and hacking off the arms of a 15-year-old girl. When they got the search warrant, they went back to Larry's house, and after knocking again and again getting no answer, they broke down the front door. They gathered evidence and also sent word to Sparks, Nevada, that Larry would need to be arrested and extradited to Modesto. Is that where his second home was? Yes. That's where he ended up going after this. He was arrested without incident at his home in Sparks. Soon the neighbors were shocked to learn that Larry had been arrested for such a heinous crime. They all said the same thing about him. He was so nice. Mm -hmm. A -hmm. peach of a guy. Oh yeah, he's a peach. He was a guy who made macrame plant hangers in his spare time. Well, that's a sign right there. (laughs) Of a serial killer. Any man that makes (laughs) macrame plant holders. He's got something up his sleeve. he's got something. Once he arrived in Modesto, detectives Brashear and Reese started their interrogation. When asked to tell them about what happened on September 29th, Larry didn't deny that he had picked up Mary. However, pretty much the rest of the story he gave to police was a pile of bullshit. And after we take a break, I'll tell you what that was. Larry's bullshit story. Oh, I can't wait to hear (laughs) this bullshit story of how, what, he accidentally cut off somebody's arms? Oh, no, 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 not at all. He didn't do it at all. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. He started off by saying he did pick up Mary at the Berkeley campus. And when she got in, she told him she needed to go to Reno, Nevada, where she had a sister, instead of the Los Angeles where her grandfather was. They were driving to Reno when Larry had to stop for gas. They both made a pit stop at the gas station, and when Mary got back into the car, she had a surveyor stick in her hand. Do you know what a surveyor stick is? Um, No, please educate me. I didn't know either, so my friend Google showed me that it's like a type of a ruler that's telescopic, so it can be quite long. And the telescopic area is rather thick, so because, you know, they're tucking other pieces of it inside of the main piece of the ruler. So surveyors use it to measure area, yeah, property and such. So picture a very thick and heavy ruler. So she gets the surveyor stick from a gas station, Oh, gets in the car, and she whacks Larry on the head with it and said, you're going to drive me to L.A. Larry said he replied, lady, you put that stick away and I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Oh, my God. Stop it. I know. Mary threatened Larry that she was going to poke his eyes out with the stick if he didn't take her to L.A. and also said that she would call the police and tell them he assaulted her. This is so stupid. It's insulting my intelligence you're telling me this right now. Oh, the cops were like, okay, and then what happened? They were Mm -hmm, just like, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." mm mm-hmm. They were exactly like we are. At some point again, they stopped so Larry could buy cigarettes. And when they went to get back onto the freeway, there were two male hitchhikers that Mary told Larry to pick up. They pick the guys up and they find out that they wanted to go to San Bernardino. Larry described the hitchhikers as, one was a white guy who coincidentally was also named Larry. (laughs) Okay. As you can imagine where the story is going. And he did say his last name was Schmidt, so I'm going to call the hitchhiker Larry Schmidt. Gotcha. And Schmidt was about 35 and around Larry Singleton's, same build, with blonde hair. The other guy was a Mexican man named Pedro, who was somewhere between 25 and 40. Schmidt and Pedro knew each other. They were friends. And while they're driving 
towards San Bernardino, one of them busts out a doobie. Or as Larry tells the cops, reefer. While they're smoking doobies, one of the hitchhikers told Larry that Mary wanted to stay stoned. And Larry responded, well, honey, if you want to get stoned, I got plenty of money. And I know you're confused by that look on your face, but he brought up the issue of his having plenty of money as a way to assure the hitchhikers he could pay for drugs, which I didn't realize until I read the story further. But yeah, that's what he means. Larry started drinking because he does have a bottle of whiskey. This is the only part of the story. That's true. That's (laughs) that's true and that the cops believed. Larry started drinking and Mary asked him if Schmidt could drive. He's stoned though, right? Yeah, he's stoned. But she bet, okay. But she wants him to drive. At this point in the story, the detectives ask Larry why he would allow Schmidt to drive. And he tells them Mary had a knife on him. So she pulled out a knife on him? Yes. And this knife just all of a sudden appeared in the story. She decided the surveying stick wasn't... Wasn't good enough. (laughs) Makes sense. Right. The foursome stopped at some bar where Schmidt and Pedro made a drug deal from someone in a green pickup truck. And a few sentences later, Larry said the pickup truck was black. So he's just bullshitting this entire story. As they get back on the freeway... All of a sudden, Pedro has a gun that he found in Larry's van, and everyone is either high or drunk. So there's a gun now. We there's a gun it. now, okay. yes. Larry asked Mary, how much would you charge to have sex with everyone? And he gave her $80. She responded that she, quote, likes to suck cocks, mm-hmm. end quote, and she gave Schmidt a blowjob. Oh. They stopped the van, and then Larry laid down in the back so Mary could give him a blowjob. Larry said Mary refused to give Pedro a blowjob because she was racist. Oh my God, just stop this shit. It's so so stupid. stupid. Then an orgy broke out and Larry passed out. But I thought she was racist. Yes, girl, exactly. However, he noted that before he passed out, Mary was naked. When he came to, Mary was gone, but her clothes were still in the van. Then he gave some more details about Schmidt and Pedro that are way too boring to go into here. During the interrogation, detectives Brashear and Reese applied the pressure to get Larry to confess because they don't believe any of this. But even after hours, he insisted he wasn't the monster who raped Mary and cut her hands off. They challenged him at one point by asking him, how could you be afraid of a little girl with a stick? I mean, you're this big, burly man. You know, what's the deal? Also, they asked him, why would Mary, who had nothing to gain by lying, say he was the culprit instead of the mystery men that Larry was talking about? Right. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Why would she want them to get away with it and And not him? Falsely accuse him. Yeah, and falsely accuse him. Exactly. Because the rest of his story had to deal with he was blaming Larry Schmidt being the Larry that Mary told the police about. So he's saying that Schmidt and Pedro were the ones that raped her and dumped her in the canyon. Meanwhile, a man named Sal Benedetto had decided to go fishing in the San Francisco Bay in an area called Fisherman's Wharf. As he cast his line into the bay, he glanced to his right and saw what he thought looked an awful lot like a human hand sitting in the rocks at the shoreline. He called the police and the responding officers came to collect it. Of course, it was Mary's hand, and this was confirmed when the x-rays from Mary's surgery were compared to the hand that was found. Eventually, Larry was arrested for raping and mutilating Mary, being charged with one count of forcible rape, one count of sodomy, two counts of forcible copulation, one count of kidnapping, one count of mayhem, and one count of attempted murder. Because of the immense pretrial media coverage. The trial was moved from Stanislaus County to San Diego, and his trial began in March of 1979. Mary bravely testified at his trial and gave a very detailed account of the horror she experienced at the hands of Larry Singleton. On March 29, 1979, Larry was found guilty of all seven counts. 
California had recently passed new sentencing guidelines, and the maximum Larry could be sentenced to, you're going to be pissed at this. I know it. I can tell by your face. Go ahead. Was a maximum of 14 years in prison. I am so astounded and pissed off right now. Mm -hmm. How is that possible for attempted murder? (sighs) Right. And if he had good behavior, he would be out in eight. Stop. No. Mm -hmm. No. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't understand the court systems back then because that's seven counts of really horrible things. Right. All felonies. Right. The judge sentenced him that 14 years was the maximum. And he said, quote, if I had the power, I would send him to prison for the rest of his natural life. Absolutely. So he kind of had his hands tied because of the sentencing guidelines. It would be discovered later that Larry had whispered to Mary while they were in court together that he would, quote, finish the job if it takes me the rest of my life. Oh, fuck him. Yes. Terrorizing. She's now 16. A 16-year-old girl. I'm so pissed. Oh, I hate him. I'm so angry right now. I hate him. Mary sued Larry in civil court and won $2.56 million in a judgment against him, but hasn't collected a dime because he was destitute. As you can imagine, the public was outraged over the seemingly short sentence that Larry received, and this led to the California legislature to pass the Singleton Bill, which ended early release for defendants who used torture in their crimes and allowed for sentences to be extended. If he had been sentenced today, he would have received multiple consecutive sentences of 15 years to life, instead of the concurrent sentences he received. But instead, you're going to tell me that he gets out in eight years, aren't you? I do, you? yes. How did you know? I know you. <laughs> yeah, while in prison, he was a model prisoner. He never got into trouble. He worked as a teacher's aide. And so he was released on parole after serving only eight years. I knew it. Yeah. His prison psychiatrist did note in his file that, quote, because he's so out of touch with his hostility and anger, he remains an elevated threat to other safety inside and outside of prison. No shit, Sherlock. I know, but they still let him out. Let me guess, he goes out to be a model citizen? (laughs) Wrong! Knew that too. Yes, he was perfect angel the end of this podcast. (laughs) I can't wait to hear what else this asshole does. Oh, he's a horrible, horrible person. I'm just, as if you all didn't think so yet. When he was released, he had a really difficult time finding a place to live because no town would accept him. People would protest even if there was a hint of him landing in their town because no one wanted this monster to prey on the citizens that they lived with. Eventually, he was allowed to live in a trailer on the grounds of San Quentin. Oh, shit. That is perfect. I know. That is fucking perfect. I I didn't even know that was a possibility. Sounds beautiful. Sounds like the (laughs) absolute number one place you should be. I know. You can make some friends there. Exactly. You know, maybe. Free lawn care. Yeah. (laughs) It's great. Unfortunately, though, that didn't last forever. He ended up finding his way back home to his native Florida, moving to Tampa, where, you guessed it, long ago, Talia, he got into more trouble. Of course he did. In 1990, he was convicted of theft twice in cases where he stole small things and got relatively light sentences of like 60 days in jail. However, this would all change and Larry would end up on death row in Florida by 1997. On February 19th, 1997, a local house painter was in a quiet neighborhood in Tampa when he noticed something horrific going on in a nearby home. A naked man covered in blood appeared to be punching or something similar, making those motions, a naked woman who was laying on a sofa, motionless. Please tell me that's not a naked Larry. (laughs) It's a naked Larry, isn't it? It's a naked Larry, yes. Fucking A. The house painter quickly called 911 and gave them all the troubling details, which included the fact that he could hear bones crunching (sighs) every time the man hit the woman. He was pretty close. Yeah. Why didn't he stop it? I have no idea. The painter's name was Gene Reynolds. He told the 911 operator that he saw the man 
beating the woman and that the man who lived in the house was the same guy who cut off that 15-year-old's arms in California. The dispatcher wasn't familiar with Mary's case, but she took down the address and sent officers to the house immediately. Now, immediately I'm putting in air quotes for Talia because immediately didn't quite mean immediately. It's all relative. The police didn't arrive to the home for 34 minutes. Oh, son of a bitch. Which would be explained later by the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office that the delay was due to a shift change and rush hour traffic. That's unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. The average response time for Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department was 9.1 minutes at the time, which is still a long fucking time. really horribly long. That's no fucking way. Especially if you're calling in seeing two bloody naked people, like something's going on. Yeah. Punching something going on. 34 minutes. When police finally arrived, they knocked on the door. As you've guessed already, a very naked Larry answered the door, covered in blood, wearing only a condom. Oh, gross. (laughs) I knew you would be grossed out. I don't even want to picture it. And if you saw the pictures of him, I mean, you don't want to picture this man naked. You really don't. Well, now that's all I can do. (laughs) Thanks. He appeared to be extremely drunk. Before he could say anything, however, because the police officer was like, what's going on? The telephone inside the house started ringing, and Larry turned to answer it. The responding officer followed him inside of the house. Wait, he's standing there naked with a condom on, covered in blood, and Mm -hmm. the phone rings, and the police are there, and he's like, hold on one second, I have Mm -hmm. to get my phone. Yes. It's ringing. Yes, he goes to get the phone. Okay. Probably because he's probably shit-faced is, you know, part of the story. As they walked through the living room, the officer saw a woman's naked body, also covered in blood laying on the sofa. He walked over to her to check her vital signs, and unfortunately, she was dead. By then, Larry was done with his phone call, I guess, and he walked over to where the officer was. The officer asked what happened, but Larry didn't say anything. He was arrested for murder and taken into the station for questioning. Those poor officers. Oh, my God. Can you... I mean, that poor woman. I mean, obviously. Yes, her too. Yes, absolutely. But the shit the police have to go through. Ugh. The victim of Larry's vicious attack was 31-year-old Roxanne Hayes, and she went by Roxy. Roxy had a previous criminal record. It was a very long one, mostly prostitution charges. And she'd been arrested about 100 times between 1992 and 1997. She was six feet tall and very shapely and was popular with the customers looking for love in the Tampa area. So he didn't even probably know her very well. Well, he had picked her up in the past twice before. So she was comfortable with him when he picked her up that day and asked her to come back to his house. She agreed to do so in exchange for $20. While the details of what actually happened can only be reported by Larry, he told police that he paid her the 20 bucks and she tried to steal his wallet to get more money from him. I read from some other sources besides the main one that I used here, which was a book by Fred Rosen called The Mad Chopper. They said that Roxy had a cocaine problem, but they were saying like she needed more money because of her drug addiction. So she tries to steal his wallet and Larry, being drunk, became enraged. It's probably a lie anyway. I know. It's probably just fucking lying. He went into his kitchen and grabbed a knife. And when he came back and Roxy saw the knife, She screamed. Larry and Roxy start struggling. Roxy trying to get away from Larry and Larry trying to stab her. And Larry's strength won out. He stabbed her numerous times. He was so filled with rage and anger, he couldn't stop. When he finally did, Roxy, laying on the sofa dying, according to Larry, whispered, for him to hold her. No, no, she didn't. No, she didn't. She didn't. And he said. Just what I think I can't hate him oh. more. And then he said, you know, all of the anger left my body. And he rocked her as she died in his arms. Nobody gives a fuck about you, Larry. No, and you're full of fucking shit. We know that's a lie. That makes me really sad for Roxy. Mm-hmm. That, you know, whatever happened to her life to get her to where. I know. That night. Yeah, happened. absolutely. 
Her autopsy showed she'd been stabbed seven times in the chest and abdomen. One stab wound was a two-inch deep cut that was directly into her heart, and this was the fatal stab wound. She bled to death in approximately 5 to 20 minutes after that wound was inflicted. She also had a perforated liver that was about 6 inches deep, and she had deep defensive wounds on the inside of her hands, which were caused by her trying to grab the knife. And I've seen pictures. It's, it's bad. And the picture was only in black and white, thank you, God. But it was deep cuts. She was beaten too, right? Yeah, she was beaten, but I don't think it was as severe as the stabbing, it obviously. Wasn't what killed her. Yeah, it wasn't what killed her. While in jail, Larry attempted suicide, but failed. He was moved to a psychiatric hospital, and he was there for a while before he ended up back at the county jail. During his trial for murdering Roxanne, Mary flew to Florida to testify on Roxy's behalf. She wanted to make sure Larry never saw the light of day to attack another woman. She told the court, quote, I was raped. I had my arms cut off. He used a hatchet. He left me to die, end quote. Larry's defense consisted of his claim he never meant to kill Roxy, and it was an accident. Mm -hmm. It was because he was trying to defend himself because she was attacking him. However, the prosecutors presented a photo of Larry taken at the time of his arrest. He's naked, bloody, and there's not a scratch on him. The jury didn't take long to deliberate, only four hours. And when they came back, they announced they found Larry guilty of murdering Roxanne. His sentence was death. At the sentencing, the judge said, quote, this was an unprovoked, senseless killing of a human being. We are living in times worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, end quote. Larry didn't serve out much of his death sentence, though, because he died in prison on December 28, 2001, at the age of 74. So he ended up only spending about four years in prison. His cause of death was cancer. Police believe that Mary and Roxanne were not his only victims and that he could have been responsible for a dozen murders. Do they have any idea any of the other potential victims? No. And he never said anything because he always insisted he was innocent. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe not with Roxy, but definitely with Mary. Mary went on to have a sad life initially, but I think she turned it all around. When Larry cut her arms off, she had been a talented dancer. She had hopes that she would someday be a great dancer, but Larry took that from her. When she was being operated on shortly after his attack on her, the surgeons had to use parts of one of her legs to save her right arm. I was thinking probably a vein or an artery. She wasn't able to ever dance again. She eventually married, but her marriage failed because her husband couldn't take the constant public intrusions into their life. Mary was frequently contacted to do interviews, you know, television, newspapers, magazines. She had two sons with her husband, but she ended up raising them as a single parent. There were talks of Mary's life being made into a movie, but nothing panned out. She tried to become a motivational speaker, but at one school, a boy in the audience yelled obscenities at her, and that was the end of that career. Kids are just horrible. God. They're just nasty. I know. I mean, I was one. That's, I know. <laughs> the most up-to-date information I could find about Mary was an article from the Seattle PI from 2003. She had become an artist living in Gig Harbor with her two sons. At the time, they were 16 and 14. An Along artist? What type of artist? Oh, well, I'm going to tell you. Oh. Along with a parrot, two dogs, hamster, fish, and her 21-year-old boyfriend, Kurt Wright. You go, girl. I know. And she called him Mr. Wright, R-I-G-H-T, where his last name was W-R-I-G-H-T. Some of Mary's favorite subjects to draw were very strong women, such as a samurai woman with swords. But she also did commission work, drawing family portraits from photos supplied to her from her customers. And she did a lot of, like, chalk pastel drawings. With her toes? No, with her prosthetics. Oh, okay. And just to let you know, she didn't have prosthetic hands, like with fingers. She had prosthetic, like hooks, like metal hooks. What? That 
could open and close, and that's what she used to paint with. Wow. I got hands and I can't. I, I know. Can't I can't draw a straight line. Create shit. Exactly. She said that she felt a tremendous feeling of freedom when Larry was arrested and convicted in Roxy's death because she lived in fear because he threatened her. Despite all this, though, she still had nightmares about the attack and she's still afraid to go to sleep sometimes and she doesn't sleep very well. She's woken up from nightmares so violently in the past, she's dislocated her shoulder and broke her ribs. What? I know. But from the article, it sounded like she made a decent life in Gig Harbor, and its citizens accepted her as one of their own. She's not treated like some sideshow attraction when she goes out in public with her prosthetic hands. And you can find her sometimes at the local pool hall or bowling alley, and she plays a mean game of pool. Now you're just making me feel like an like an empathetic soul. I can't play pool either. I know, me either. And I bowl like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I need the bumpers in the bowling alley. <laughs> if she starts a true crime podcast, we're in trouble. <laughs> she had financial troubles and tried to make ends meet on a disability payment that she received from the government, but it's not much. She did make a little money from the art commissions, but again, it's not a ton. At the time of the article, she was charging $300 for a commission portrait and was selling her framed chalk pastel drawings of powerful women for about $1,800. Wow. So I hope she's doing well today because I didn't find anything more up to date than that because she didn't like to do a lot of interviews and things like that. I thought you said she did a lot of interviews. Mm -mm. Well, she was contacted to do interviews, but she didn't do a lot. So that's my story. Wow, I really hate that Larry guy. Oh, he's a fucker. I hate him. So. Thanks for that. You're I welcome. didn't know it. If everyone could please subscribe or follow on your podcast app. That'd be great. That'd be great. I want to take one second, Tanya, before we go and talk to people about our Apple channel called Crimes and Consequences X and reach out to all of our Apple channel subscribers. We have lots of you guys. We didn't know because Apple doesn't have very good analytics. So send us an email at contact at tntcrimes.com and we'll give you a shout out. We have had a couple of people reach out. And I want to give them shout outs. Yes, let's do it. I personally promised Josie that we would give her a shout out. Hey, Josie. Thank you, Josie. And we also have Carmen and Nina that are subscribers to our channel. And then we have a whole bunch of new members we want to give shout outs to. And for those that don't know, members are our Patreons. And our Patreon membership is very similar to our Apple channel subscribers. They're basically the same thing. It's the same episodes. Yep. So if you want to subscribe and get ad-free early releases and exclusive episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes or subscribe on our Apple channel, Crimes Consequences X. Through your Apple Podcast app. But I don't have an iPhone. But I do, so I know that's how you do it. We'd like to give some shout outs to all our new members for their support, because they're awesome. Yes, let's do it, Talia. All right, we got a lot. Okay. Hang tight. I will save my applause for the end. Thank you. Jessica, Trish, Lisa with a Y, Linda, Rob, Monica, Jennifer, Wendy, Rachel, Helen B, Laura L, Aaron, Andrea, Joanne, Helen, Bailey, Casey, Tina, William, Ginger, Travis, and Sandra. They're like... Brangelina? Yes. <laughs> Victoria, Michelle, Beth, Trina, Liam, Jonathan, Brandon, Betty, Kimmy, Ashley, Mary, Creek Lake City. They know okay. who they are. You know who you are. Shylin, Marge, Amberly, Jessica, Russ, Jillian, Aaron, Amanda, Amber, Heather, and Angie. Yay! Yay! You guys win the super awesome award. (laughs) Thank you to all of our new members and to our Apple subscribers. Welcome aboard. (laughs) We are blessed to have all you guys, seriously. And I want to thank everybody else for listening to us, too. We appreciate all you guys. What else you got, Tanya? If you want to find out more about this episode or our past episodes, you can go to our website, tntcrimes.com. You can find us also on social media, Facebook and Instagram, at Hardcore True Crime. Yeah, that was good. And I think that's it. One more shout out. Oh, who? We have a contributor to our website. Oh, yeah. Her name is 
Mariah Hamilton, and she's writing in our True Crime Stories blog. Yay! Yay, Thank you, Mariah. Thank you, Mariah. Her stories are really interesting, so if you guys get a chance, it's at tntcrimes.com under Cases, True Crime Stories. Thank you again. Until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.